Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this is, for the moment, our last C-Media um, event. This is the end of our project this week. I think everybody here knows what C-Media is, even the first year students. I explained it to you, but just in case, it's a video project um, funded by Europe um, and for us by HoWest. And the idea is to give young people video skills, to bring in experts to talk about media topics, and to give people like you, journalism students, volunteers, etc., the opportunity to make content. So I'm very happy right now to have our international speakers here, who you'll meet throughout the evening. We chose this, the subject of investigative journalism, well, because it's an important one, first of all, um, it combines all the reasons of being a journalist and what journalists try to do. We called the event Under the Radar because investigative journalism often looks at topics and exposes people, crime, corruption, that wouldn't be in the news if people didn't take time to do that. So I will start by introducing now Robert Moraldi, Professor Robert Moraldi, he was my teacher of journalism. He was my a professor. He taught me journalism one, journalism two, public affairs reporting, journalism law. And what he really taught me most of all is passion, to be passionate about journalism. It's an honor to have him. Um, why is he here? Not just because I know him, but because he's really an expert in investigative reporting. He won the 2013 prize for best media biography. Did I get that right? And that's a great thing. Congratulations. Um, and it's for a book he wrote about Seymour Hirsch. I don't know, have any of you heard about Seymour Hirsch? Okay, well, that's good, because he's going to tell you all about him. He's a very important figure in American investigative reporting and in journalism. So please give a warm welcome to Robert Moraldi. So if you want to be an investigative reporter, you roll your sleeves up, first thing. You open your tie. And loosen it. Right? Can I do that? And then you get ready to go. And you go and you go and you go until you get the bad guys. Um, investigative reporting is a wonderfully exciting part of, uh, of journalism. It's uh, long been a wonderfully exciting part of American journalism. So I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, where'd she go? Up yeah. oh, there she is. Thank you for inviting me. Sarah knew me when I had hair. Uh, no, huh? <laughs> 1989, let's see. Um, I should first off say, Goedemiddag, uh, yes? Uh, my wife and I lived in uh, the Netherlands for, uh, in 1991 for six months, and I learned Goedemiddag, Goedenavond, Goedemorgen. I also learned how to say, uh, that was close, wasn't it? I, um, I also learned how to say, would you like to have sex in the kitchen in Dutch? But I don't think I... That's, what, that's, that's not appropriate, but I did, that, that's, that's the, only, uh, the only Dutch I know, so I'm sorry. Uh, I, I know no French at all, so I have to speak to you in English. I will try to speak as slowly as possible. And if I use a word or an expression, like under the radar, I will try to explain it to you, because uh, I apologize for not being able to, to speak your language. Um, I have lived my entire life in and around journalism. I started working as a newspaper reporter when I was 16 years old. I was writing sports stories to begin, and then I moved into writing news stories, and then I moved from writing news stories into what resembled an investigative reporter. And then I left journalism, and I started to teach journalism, and I taught journalism and have taught journalism for many years. I've been responsible for creating and producing six books, and four of those books are about investigative reporting. So much of my life and career for four decades, for 40 years, um, is about looking into, understanding, and studying investigative reporting. 
And the why for that is, first off, in America, it's, it's long been a fascinating thing to watch some of these great American journalists. And beyond that, it is an incredibly exciting field. Um, some of the best American, I consider it the highest form of, of journalism. I consider it the most noble form of journalism. I consider it, in some ways, perhaps the most important part of journalism. Now, this is not to suggest to you at all that there are not many forms of journalism. There are many kinds of journalism, and all of them are interesting. Um, this is just one strain or one form of journalism. And the conference here, these couple days, at least today, we're going to be talking about this one particular form of journalism, investigative reporting. Now, it, it actually has a number of different names, and I'll be using some of those names and phrases for you. Uh, if you look above, I hope you can read that. Today it's called investigative reporting. In an earlier era, in an earlier part of American life, uh, around 1900 or so, between 1900 and the beginning of World War I, 1915, it was known in America as muckraking journalism, which really means raking up the muck, pardon my expression, raking up the shit of society, bringing it to the surface, getting below the surface and seeing what's, what's taking place. It's sometimes today called expose journalism. There should be a little emphasis over the E. Expose journalism, a form of journalism that exposes the terrible problems that we have, that we have in, in, in all of our societies, in all of our worlds. Uh, someone once said, the investigative reporter, I have a, a somewhat prominent Roman or Italian nose, which is good for investigative reporting because the investigative reporter's nose twitches when things smell. When something smells bad, when there is corruption, when there is evil, when there is injustice, when there is a wrong, when there is something bad that you see, that's when the investigative reporter goes to work. That's when his or her nose starts to twitch and they want to see if they can expose the problem, bring out the problem. Because that problem is not always evident, it's many times below the surface, and we have to dig, we have to dig, and we do what's called, we do what's called expose journalism. It is sometimes known as enterprise journalism. That's a fairly recent phrase, and I like that phrase. You may not know the word enterprise. You get a job, and you're, the person who employs you gives you a description, and here's what the job is. And then if you do your job well, you fulfill all, you do all the things that the description tells you you're supposed to do. But the employee you like is the one who says, I see other things that need to be done. I'm going to go beyond the job description, and I'm going to use my own initiative, my own enterprise. I'm going to decide that this is something wrong that needs to be investigated. I'm not going to wait for the rest of the world. I'm going to use my own initiative, my own enterprise. And so the good investigative reporter, the good reporter, the good journalist, has enterprise on their own. They decide to go out and look at a problem. Uh, sometimes known as watchdog journalism. Do you know that word, watchdog? What's a watchdog? Anyone know? If you have a dog, and you put the dog at your fence, and what do you hope the dog will do? He will bark when someone is coming, or when someone tries to break into the house. And watchdog journalism, the good investigative reporter is a watchdog. In fact, not only is the good investigative reporter a watchdog, because he or she watches to see what problems are, and alerts the public to the problems, but the watchdog is a bit like a pit bull. You ever know what a pit bull does? Say? He never lets go. Thank you. That is the answer. Because the watchdog journalist, the pit bull journalist, takes a bite and doesn't let go until they get to the root of the issue and the problem. Um, we sometimes call it the journalism of outrage. And that simply means that when you see something that's bad, when you see something that you think is evil, when you see something that needs fixing, or you need someone that needs help, then you are angry. You are indignant. You are outraged. 
And the journalist who is outraged and the journalist who is indignant becomes an investigative reporter to try to find out and to try to make things better. So those are some of the words that will come up as I talk to you a little more and give you some, some examples. This is if you are considering going into journalism or have started in the world of journalism, as you know, Sarah, Sarah mentioned, it's a, it's a wild and crazy time in journalism. Um, amazing changes continue to take place. Now there is this school of thought and some people say, ah, journalism is dead. Don't believe it because it's not true Absolutely not true. Journalism has changed greatly, is changing greatly. I like to use this analogy. I was watching a, a television last night in my hotel room, and actually it was in Dutch, so I couldn't understand what they were saying. But I could see that here was a man, he went into a forest, and the forest had just recently burned down. There were some tree stumps remaining, a, a few trees still lived, but the, all the ground was black and charred from the fire. But he was going around with the camera, and do you know what he was doing with the camera, what they were looking for? New growth. And he started to point out, ah, look, terrible fire, but look at the new growth. Look at the new shoot. Look at what's coming up here. And if you know what happens after a forest fire and the forest burns down, it comes back with tremendous energy, tremendous new growth. In fact, sometimes, the growth is better, the energy and the forest is better than before because the old dead growth is cut away and new energy comes about. The sunlight can come in and it's greater than it's ever been before. That's journalism today, by the way. Journalism today shows this tremendous, tremendous new growth. I'm, I'm 64 years old. I wish I was starting again as a young journalist. And I'm often asked, well, what would you do as a young journalist? And my answer is I would start my own website. I would get a little money from enough places and I'd begin my own little publication because we all now can be publishers. We all now can go out and we can all be this, watchdog journalists. Um, before I get into some examples, one of my own and a few others from recent awards, award-winning pieces of, of journalism, um, I wanted to just kind of remind you in some ways why we do journalism, or at least tell you why we, we do journalism. Um, and why I, anyone who says, well, journalism is dying or is, 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 is going away, it won't go away, it can't go away. Because if journalism goes away, democracy will go away. Democracy demands journalism. I have a quote I hope you can read from a famous American political philosopher, was a journalist also, wrote for newspapers and magazines and wrote books. His name was Walter Lippmann. And sometime around 1930, Walter Lippmann said, and this is true today, truer than ever today, Walter Lippmann said, the press is an organic necessity in a democratic society. My, uh, okay? Um, we have to have a press. We have to have journalism. Why? Because it's the glue and the lubricant of a society. It lubricates the society. It makes all the parts work. It holds the society together. Why does it do that? How does it do that? It does that because democracy, we can get into wonderful philosophical discussions about what is democracy, but in my mind, most of all, democracy means that the people, you, all of the people you know, all of the people you live with have to make choices. You've got to choose your own life and what you want to do with your life, and you've got to make choices about public policies, about the government, about the EU, about whether to go to war or not go to war, how to improve the economy. We have all these choices to make about public policy issues. And the only way people can make choices is they need information, and that's where you come in. You come in as a journalist because your job and what you do is you provide the lubrication, the glue, to provide people with the kind of information that they need in order to make a democratic society function and work. And that's why journalism won't go away, because people will always demand and need 
information about their world, so you can give them a view of what the world looks like. In America, we sometimes call the press the fourth branch of government. Um, in America, we have three main branches of our government, three main parts. There is the part you perhaps know about, and that's the president, the executive. And then the other part is our Congress or our legislature. They make the laws. And then there are the judges, the judiciary, and they make decisions about the laws. Three branches of government. And then there's a fourth branch, unofficial, although it's in our Constitution. And the government, the other three branches, can't touch it. They can't stop it. They can't get in the way of it. They can't interfere with it. They can't shut it down. They can't silence it. And why is that? Because that fourth branch of government, the press, is necessary and important to oversee and watch all the other branches. Why? Because you report to the people and make sure that they have the kind of information that they need. Investigative reporting plays an extremely important role in this form of democracy, in this watchdog, uh, in this watchdog society. Um, I wanted to give you a couple examples because uh, this form of journalism, investigative reporting, muckraking, has been practiced in America for more than 100 years. I don't like to come to another country and tell you that what we do will work necessarily in your country or in your society. Every country has its own traditions. Every country has its own particular needs. And it's not to say that exactly what happens in America, certainly. In fact, a lot of what happens in America, I hope you never do. Um, but uh, certainly, one of the best things that has come out of American journalism has been this tradition of investigative reporting or muckraking journalism. It actually begins in America around the year 1900, more than 100 years ago. It begins in America because we were increasingly becoming a society controlled and run and ruled by rich people. We probably are still that kind of country. But in 1900, when it became clear that the rich were increasingly dominating and controlling American government and American life, a group of journalists began to write about all the problems this was causing. These journalists were known and were called by the American president, Theodore Roosevelt, the muckraking journalists. He gave a name to these journalists, and he called them the muckrakers. This was not a compliment. He was not happy. In fact, he was very worried that their stories would upset the public so much that they might try to overthrow the society. These journalists were very powerful, and they wrote a number of very, very powerful, very, very critical stories, and they actually led to a huge change in American life. It's the first time in America where our central government began to try to control business, began to try to rule, regulate, and, and stop business from trampling the rights of small people, the, the citizens. One example, 1908. Uh, a, a person who's somewhat forgotten, I actually wrote his biography in the year 2004, and his name was Charles Edward Russell. And Charles Edward Russell, uh, his grandparents came from Scotland, his, father was a, his grandfather was a, was a minister, his father was a newspaper editor. Charles Edward Russell was living in New York City. And Charles Edward Russell discovered one day, have you been to New York City? I don't know if you've been to. I hope you get to Manhattan, uh, New York City someday. Go down to Lower Manhattan, and there's a church called Trinity Church. And in 1908, Trinity Church, a Protestant church, was the richest church in America. And the richest church in America also owned, operated, and ran the largest, worst slum tenement housing of anyone else in New York City. They owned more buildings with terrible condition. No running water, no lights, garbage strewn all over. People living in these buildings dying of tuberculosis. All owned by the richest church in America. Russell discovered this. 
on his own enterprise, he went out and began to visit apartment after apartment after apartment and came back and wrote three articles in magazines that went across America and he exposed the tenements of Trinity Church. Trinity Church was quickly forced to clean up all of its apartments, all of its housing. And within five years, Trinity Church became one of the best landlords in New York City because they were exposed by this great watchdog journalist, Charles Edward Russell. Wonderful example of, now this is not business corruption. This is not government corruption. This was corruption by a, by a church, by the richest church in America. Social justice. Russell was accused, uh, someone said to him, you are, you are a muckraker. He said, I love being a muckraker. What I don't love is walking into an apartment and seeing a child dying and no one helping him. And that I cannot live with. And Russell decided that it was his job to expose this and make condi conditions better. Jump ahead many years, 1969. One of the famous examples. Muckraking journalism around World War I, by the way, disappears. For the most part, everyone was too concerned with World War I, too concerned with the horrible effects of World War I. And America enters a somewhat conservative period for many years. And investigative reporting disappears. And then it reappears again in America in the 1960s. America is in the middle of a terrible war. We seem to always be in the middle of some terrible war. But in 1969, we were involved in a terrible war in Vietnam. Seymour Hersh, 32 years old, born in Chicago. His parents immigrated to America from Poland. Seymour Hersh gets a telephone call from a source who could not be identified. But he tells Seymour Hersh, here's what I've heard. I've heard that an American soldier is being detained, held in a prison, in a military prison in the south, south of the United States. And he's been accused of ordering and participating in the murder of a number of civilians in Vietnam. And Hirsch's nose for news began to twitch. He knew that this was, first off, a story that had never been reported before, that no one knew about. He knew it was a story that the American government would never want to become public. And he knew that it was a story he had to get. He immediately hopped on a plane. He flew to this military barracks. I should tell you, this military bar barracks had population, huge military base, half the size of the population of Kortrek. About 30,000 people worked. So here's Seymour Hirsch, walks into a military base early in the morning, 30,000 people, and he's trying to find one soldier. And he spends the entire day knocking on doors. He's looking for William Calley, the soldier accused. Calley, where's Calley? Anybody see Calley? He poses as a lawyer to try to make believe he was a lawyer. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm here to see Calley. All day long, he looks, he looks, he looks. He cannot find William Calley. Finally, late in the day, 8 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night, he meets a soldier, sits down, has a few beers with the soldier, and the soldier finally says, oh, over there, there he is. Calley, there's Calley. And Hirsch walks up to Calley, talks to Calley. Calley had not ever talked to a reporter before. He makes friends with Calley. They go up to Callie's apartment. Callie's girlfriend cooks them a steak. They drink some whiskey. And Callie tells him the story of how he led a troop of American soldiers in 1968 into a small village called My Lai. They were looking for the enemy. They couldn't find the enemy. And when they couldn't find the enemy, they rounded up everyone in the village, old men, old women, young children. They lined them up. They shot them, and killed them, and pushed them into a big ditch. One little child ran out to try to get away. Callie shot him, killed him. The worst atrocity, this became known as the My Lai Massacre, the worst atrocity in the American side of the, of the Vietnam War. Hirsch flies back to Washington to write his story. He was 
angry. He was disgusted with his country. He wrote the story on a typewriter on the airplane. He was crying. He gets home. He files the story. He eventually writes five stories about the My Lai Massacre. And it becomes a worldwide sensation. London newspapers, headline, My Lai Massacre. Is this the end of the war for America? One of the great stories, he wins the Pulitzer Prize in American journalism and becomes famous as one of the kind of great American investigative rep reporters. This story plays a great role in simply tr changing, beginning to change American opinion about should we be in that war? What kind of war could this possibly be that American soldiers would do such a horrible, horrible thing? And it was a turning point in public opinion in America. 1969, Seymour Hearst, the famous My Lai Massacre story. Um, let me tell you one story of my own experience. It doesn't compare. In fact, it's trivial and silly. I almost don't want to tell it, but I, I'd like to make a point with it. This is the first time I discovered investigative reporting. I was a young reporter in my mid-20s, working in New York City, and I got a telephone call. And the telephone call came from a man who owned a tavern, brasserie, bar. And this tavern was located in an area of New York City with a lot of water. He actually had a stream running underneath his, his, his tavern. And because of the stream, rats were climbing out of the stream into his tavern. Is that Dutch word, rat? Yes? Um, the, the rats were climbing into his stream. And so he's trying to basically somehow figure out, can he get the government to help him? I said, well, what have you done? He says, I will come to see you. He comes to see me. He had a stack of letters, probably 50 letters. He had written to every government agency you could possibly imagine. America has many layers of government. There's local government, there's city government, there's, there's a borough government, there's state government, federal government. He had written letters to everyone. Nothing had happened. So I decided, as a young reporter, little enterprise. I took the letters, and I called all of the 40 or 50 government agencies that he had written to. No one had, could find the letter. No one remembered his letters. No one had ever done anything about it. And the next day, I simply wrote a long story about the man with the rats who no one cared about. And so my first, uh, they put the story on the first page. The next morning, the telephone rings. It's the owner of the tavern. And he says, Rob, Rob, he says, you must come down here. You must come down. I said, why? What's wrong? He says, please, come here. You have to come here. And I come to his tavern. And the tavern, it was 9 o'clock in the morning. They were not there to drink duvels. Um, they were there because my story had appeared in the newspaper. And they all came from every level of government to suddenly, finally help the man out. There were camera crews, television camera crews from two New York City television stations there to film. Where are the rats? Let's film him standing near the water. And suddenly, everyone swarmed around his, his tavern. The power of the press. My first brush with what it is that investigative reporting can possibly do. And within a month, there was a pipe covered up the stream, and the man's problems disappeared. He, he wanted to buy me beer. I think he, he said to me, here's a ticket. You can come to my tavern for the rest of your life and have free, free beers. I, I never took, him up, took, took advantage of this. I should have. Um, but investigative reporting is a very powerful tool. So sometimes it's on a local level, small. Sometimes on an international level, the My Lai Massacre. Sometimes on a city level, Charles Edward Russell. Um, you may have followed recently a story, which I'm simply calling uh, the NSA files. Now, investigative reporting is, of course, a great American tradition. It begins in the turn of the century, 1900s, revives again in the 1960s in America. is something that is practiced very well in most of our major, major, major publications. But it's not just an American tradition. Because last year, Glenn Greenwald and I think six or seven of his colleagues published stories. Someone, 
Edward Snowden, leaked to Greenwald and his colleagues hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of classified documents. And these documents showed shocking, although shouldn't be shocking because we've had many examples of this in the past, shockingly that the American National Security Agency, one of our spying agencies, was spying on American citizens, looking at our email, listening to our telephone calls, but it wasn't just Americans. It was leaders of foreign governments, extensive, huge spying by an American agency. Shocked America, shocked the world, has changed the landscape of discussion about the power, has showed also increasingly the contacts between the big technology companies, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, and the government, the government forcing them to turn over lots of their materials, this huge spying that took place. Uh, Greenwald and the National Guardian, National Guardian British publication, although he was located in, 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 uh, in, in America when he wrote these stories. So we have British uh, organization, um, the, the National Guardian writing the NSA files just, just last year. I don't know if you've heard about this story. The Girl Who Got Tied Down. You may have seen the movie, what's the movie? Um, tattoo, help me out. Yes, thank you, The Girl with the Good Dragon Tattoo. Wonderful movie, dramatic movie. Well, Swedish radio wrote the real story because as it turned out, they were able to uncover on Swedish radio the story of a young Swedish woman who had a very similar kind of experience. Raped in her foster home, taken advantage of by police authorities. Eventually, they forced the police chief to have to resign. Psychiatrist who treated her was accused also of molesting her. She went through this entire Swedish social service system and was treated horribly. And of course, after the stories appeared, the entire system began to be looked at, to begin to be scrutinized. The expose journalism forced the Swedish government to make dramatic, radical changes in, the, in, in what took place. Britain, Sweden, examples not just, not just from, from America. Uh, let me get to one more local example. And uh, Mary Beth Pfeiffer will talk to you in a, in a few moments. And if you don't know, Mary Beth and I are, um, we actually are married. And we met in a newsroom many years ago as, as newspaper reporters. And not only have, have I written books about investigative reporting and studied investigative journalism and muckraking journalism, but I have lived with investigative reporting for many years because she is an investigative reporter. And uh, I live in uh, 100 miles north of New York City. And um, we live in an area called the Hudson Valley near the Hudson River of, of, of New York. And for reasons I'm not quite sure about, and she could tell you more, we are the capital of Lyme disease. Do you know Lyme disease? Lyme disease is a, a little tick that bites you, and then suddenly you get these symptoms, and it is actually a worldwide problem. I know it's a problem in Netherlands. I understand it's a problem in France, and a problem in, uh, I think it's a problem in Belgium. And uh, I watched as her nose for news twitched as she began to pursue this story. I watched her come home at night angry because government officials were not interested in this story. I watched her fight with government officials. I watched her begin to kind of develop a following of people who believed in this story as so important. And so I saw suddenly this story turn into a major, major, not only local story, but eventually a national story. We right now have in our American Congress a law pending that will actually change some of the rules and regulations concerning Lyme disease. Um, investigative reporting, local reporting, national reporting, international reporting. challenge for you 
as a young journalist is to ask yourself a very basic question. Why might I wish to choose journalism? This is an exciting time in journalism. We have the chance, you know, I'm wearing a tie here, you probably can't see it. And on my tie, do you know what it is? Can you see? Anybody see? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a man reading a newspaper. And I think there's a couple women here reading, reading newspapers. If we made this tie today, this tie was actually given to me as a present by my friend Marianne Peters from the Netherlands uh, many years ago. If we made this tie today, Help me out. What would be on this tie today? Yes, they'd have an i. They'd be an iPad. What else? A smartphone, perhaps. A camera. Uh, the the technology would change. The platform would change. We'd have people reading mobile devices, and some might say, "Well, what happens to the newspaper? What happens to the newspaper? It's now on those mobile devices." So you are entering. A time of journalism that it is extremely exciting. You have the chance to tell your stories with words, the traditional format, with audio, with photos, with video, digital storytelling. You have the chance to make tremendous changes in your society and your world. If you choose investigative reporting, all these options open up to you. And some might say, well, the media world, the journalism world is shrinking. Well, just the opposite. The journalism world is expanding. And now suddenly you can write a story and you link it to people on Twitter and you link it to people on Facebook. And you can put up a short video on YouTube. And there are tremendous new possibilities. And a story that's, that's written by you here can be looked at people in other countries if it has that kind of relevance. And suddenly we can have the potential I hate to exaggerate it, but we have the potential to alter and change what takes place in our world. It's a very exciting time in journalism for all sorts of reasons. One of, is, one of them is the technological possibilities. The other is there continues to be this possibility that we choose to look for bad things taking place in our world, and we decide when our noses twitch that this is a story that needs to be written. This is a story that I need to pursue. This is a story that I need to expose. This is something that I need to dig down deeply in order to find out what's really happening and help democracy function better than it is currently functioning. Um, so I'm always believing that the glass, I should fill my water glass and show you, but my glass is always half full. The world of journalism today is filled with possibilities for you. There is this rich tradition of investigative reporting out there for you to follow. If you, I could just, if you're really interested in investigative journalism, I'd suggest three websites. One is the website of the Pulitzer Prizes. Pulitzer.org. The other is there's an entire organization in America devoted just to investigative reporting called Investigative Reporters and Editors, IRE. www.ire.org. They list all of their award winning stories and you can link to their stories. And then there is uh, at Long Island University in New York City something called the Polk Awards, P O L K where they give awards every year to the best investigative reporting. If you really want to know what's taking place and see the incredible range of stories about injustices in the world, check out these websites and look at this very rich, very exciting, and, and what I would consider to be um, the most noble tradition in American journalism, the tradition of investigative reporting. I look forward over the next couple of days to working with you. I can't expect that in two days you're going to be doing investigative stories per se. But it's certainly something to keep in mind. It's a mentality, a way to approach the world that I'm going to discover what the truth is. And I'm going to dig down deeply and find out as much as I can to expose problems. And I look forward to working with you over the next couple of days and seeing if we can help craft some nice projects here. And again, um, thank you for having me here today. It's nice to be back in your country. Sarah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Wait.
wait a moment. Do we have some questions? I would encourage everybody here to ask some questions. You don't have to be shy. Even just to practice, if you're afraid to ask questions, it's a good moment to, to do it. I had uh, one quick question. Yes. Um, did you have any kind of degree before you went into journalism? Because I didn't understand it from the story you gave me. My, uh, my first degree, my first college degree is in political science. So I studied political science first. I then worked for one year as a reporter, went back to university, got a master's degree in journalism, studied journalism for one year, came back into journalism, worked in journalism, eventually becoming an investigative reporter for probably another six years. And then I completed a PhD. I'm Dr. Morality and completed a PhD studying American studies, American civilization with an emphasis on journalism. And then I went into university teaching where I taught journalism. I have always tried to balance being a journalist with understanding and studying the world of, of journalism. Um, but I have th three, three degrees, actually. So what's the school you taught in? I'm sorry? What's the school you taught in? I, uh, for two years, I taught, well, for many years, uh, as a part-time teacher, I taught at a small college in New York City called Wagner College. And then I taught for two years at St. John's University in New York City. And since 1982, where Sarah studied, I'm with the State University of New York at a college uh, 100 miles north of New York City with about 8,000 students. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are people like Truman Capote and uh, Peter de Vries, are they investigative reporters? Truman Capote is more what we would consider to be a literary journalist. So he writes non-fiction, long narrative non-fiction, but more in a literary vein than in an investigative vein. Mm -hmm. I don't know De Vries's work. Uh, he's a Dutch uh, uh, journalist who well, uh, investigated a, a murder in a, a different country, not in uh, the Netherlands. Right. And uh, he collected evidence, but uh, the first time he got away, but a few years later, uh, the same uh, suspect committed another murder, and then he got caught. And now he's spending uh, a very long time in jail in some that, faraway country. That sounds like an investigative reporter to me. Yeah. One who one who bid in and wouldn't and and wouldn't let go. I had yeah. a, a professor many years ago, who said, "Well, all journalism is investigative, and that's true. Bullshit. All should." Well, it should it's be. It's not true. Okay. It, <laughs> it should be. <laughs> is it? No, absolutely not. But uh, certainly, uh, even uh, basic journalism at any level should be investigative. Is it practiced that way? Absolutely not. But it, it certainly could be. Anybody else? Um, I was wondering how do you get the funding to start such a big project like writing a biography? I've had a private publisher, and so um, you get an advance of money and you work on your, your project. But I also have been a full-time professor, so I have a job, and I do my book work in and around my full-time te teaching job. If you're asking, however, if you wish to do investigative journalism as a freelance journalist, it's very difficult. Maybe you could address it? Listen, I'm going to talk about that later, okay? I'd, I'd just like to say that, you know, you always have the money to start an investigation, and I've never seen an investigation that was not published. Okay. We'll come back to that. Okay. Other questions? Oops. We're at fault. Shouldn't be a fault. Uh, seeing that um, you have to be quite nosy to be an uh, investigative journalist. Um, where do you set the line between going in someone's privates, by example? That's always a great question in, in ethics. And in fact, the person whose biography I just wrote, Seema Hirsch, um, is often criticized for being, for almost blackmailing people. 
So if he finds something out about someone's private life, he will threaten to expose that private life if the person doesn't give them other information. And I think that would be considered to be problematic. Perhaps you know, you'll, you'll hear mo more about that. That's always a, a, a difficult question for how far to go. I mean, my own rule was I would go quite far to get a story but not break the law. But short of that, there still are always discussions as to how far should you go in order to, in order to get, a, get a story. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then let's give another uh, round of applause for Professor Moraldo. Thank you.